Many are of the opinion that men do not like to think, that they will do much to avoid it, that they prefer to repeat instead. But in spite of many factors that are inimical to real thinking, that suffocate it, here and there it emerges and flourishes. Often, one gets the strong impression that men, even children, long for it. These are the words of uh, Max Wertheimer in his book, Productive Thinking. I'd like to argue that you don't know how to think, or that you can't think, and so hopefully this irks you a little bit, um, and you want to demonstrate that you do know how to think. Um, so before I go into um, proving to you that you have no idea how to think, um, I want to talk about a couple of concepts within thinking. The first kind of thinking he describes as logical thinking. Now again, we're going to call these thinking, or thought, really, um, he thinks of them more as reflexes. Now, so the first thing he defines here is logic. He writes, some psychologists would hold that a person who is able to think is intelligent when he can carry out the operations of traditional logic correctly and easily. The inability to form general concepts, to abstract, to draw conclusions and syllogisms of certain formal types is viewed as a mental deficiency, which is determined and measured in experiments. However one may view classic logic, it had and has great merits. So he described a few of these. In the decisiveness of its will to truth, in the concentration of the basic difference between a mere assertion, a belief, and a judgment, uh, its emphasis on proof, in the seriousness of the rules of discussion, insistence on stringency and rigor in every step, and so on. These things we would, we would hold in high esteem. If somebody can apply the rules of logic, then they must be smart. They must be able to think very well. The second one he defines is called associationism. So he writes, thinking is like a chain of ideas, a chain of stimuli and responses. Basically, the items are connected in the way in which my friend's telephone number is connected with his name, in which nonsense syllables become reproducible when learned in a series of such syllables, or in which a dog is conditioned to respond with salivation to a certain musical sound. So, for instance, when the bell rings in high school, students put their things, uh, put their things in their bag and get up and go. Um, does that mean that they're thinking, they're problem solving, or have they simply learned this behavior? Can they do so without thinking? And that, of course, is Bertheimer's argument. So logic and associationism both sound an awful lot like thinking. If you look at your education, um, there's a good chance that most of what you've done, most of the tests that you've done well on, are nothing but following rules and repeating what you had learned to repeat in the particular order in which you learned to repeat them. And so here's an example for you. Uh, if you can solve this problem, then perhaps you do know how to think. But in the five years that I've presented this, and it comes right out of his book, uh, in the five years that I've presented this, no student has ever been able to solve this problem. All right, so take a look at this picture. I'm curious if you understand the relationship between two opposite angles. We'll call them A and B. What is the relationship between angle A and angle B? Okay, of, of course, you probably got it. A equals B. When two lines intersect, opposite angles are equal, they're identical to one another. Okay, good, we're only halfway there. Solve the proof. How do you know that opposite angles are equal? Go ahead and pause the video and solve the proof. So following Max Wertheimer, my argument is you don't know how to think. Let's look back at logic. Why is that a bad thing? Well, um, if you can trust the source that you're being fed these rules, um, then you can trust the result. But if you don't understand the rules that you're following, um, then you run into the problem of doing something that you have no intention of doing. Let's just take a very simple example. So let's say I'm giving you directions on how to get from point A to point B, um, and, and you are standing on point A, and point B is directly across the street. All right, I'm trying to get you to point B. You don't know how to get there. Um, let's say uh, it's the McDonald's and it's directly across the street from you. You can't see for whatever reason, and you're taking, you're blindly trusting the, the rules that I'm giving you, or the directions that I'm giving you. Instead of telling you to just cross the intersection and enter the driveway, the parking lot, I tell you to turn right and drive 15 miles before uh, turning left and driving like another 15 miles, right? Uh, and, and I can continue this on until you've been driving for 14 hours, and then, of course, at the end of 14 hours, you will arrive at McDonald's, you followed every one of my directions, and it got you there, and you think, the proof of these directions is in the result, and I, I've arrived there. Was it a better way? Maybe, um, but I, I don't understand the relationship between A and B. I only know the steps to get there. When Max Wertheimer sat in the back of this classroom, he saw students just apply these rules, 
and, and now he even created a few, um, you can look them up in his book, he created a few ways of solving a math problem where you're doing like 45 steps, the kind of ridiculous directions that I just gave you about how to get across the street to McDonald's. Um, he was giving students like 45 step problems when really it only required three and students were following them and they were proud of themselves. They said, look, I got the right, I got the right answer. And he was thinking, how can you do this uh, and think that there's nothing wrong with this, um, with this method? How often do you do this? Following your Garmin, following your um, your directions application on your uh, smartphone. You're blindly turning right, you're blindly turning left. Um, is this problem solving? Is this thinking? No, it's simply uh, automatically following directions that you're being given. Um, so, so that's logic. Well, what about associationism? Well, that's the problem that I just showed you. To solve the proof, you need to understand not just the relationship between A and B, but their um, identical relationship to a third angle that they share, where both of them border one side of this angle. So to really understand those two angles, you need to think of the third angle. There's some important context there that you miss out on if you're just repeating answers. All right, so, so far what we've looked at um, are associationism and logic and thinking, and the, the argument here is that neither of those are thinking. It's how we solve most of our problems, but it's not thinking. So what is thinking? Okay, so logic is just blindly following directions without really understanding the relationship that you have with the problem that you're trying to solve. Associationism is simply knowing the right answer uh, to, to give at the right time. So you see a problem, you just know what the answer is. You don't understand the answer, but you know that, oh, here's what happens when that's the case. Or when I see this, here's the answer. Um, neither of these are actually thinking. Uh, why is this a problem? We, we get by for the most part. We got through geometry, statistics, algebra and calculus simply following rules and, and repeating information that we were told. Um, what's the problem with this? Well, from a psychological standpoint, look at the way it positions the learner in relationship to what is learned or the subject matter. They're completely uninvolved. It doesn't matter if it's them, if it's their mom, if it's their grandmother, or if it's some person they've never met before. The solution is always the same. It assumes that the learner is inconsequential. The learner does not matter. The task of problem solving is simply taking a problem solution and, and, and adding it to the person. Um, the person plays no role in problem solving. Problem solving belongs to the answer and not the person. That's the serious issue. With logic and associationism, problem solving does not belong to the actual problem solver. There's no identification as a problem solver. You either get the solution or you don't. The solution exists out there, uh, and I just find it, and I plug it in, um, but in terms of my identity as a problem solver, it doesn't matter if it's me or anybody else. There's just a problem and the right answer. Think of the long-term consequences of this kind of education. When every day you're, you face a new problem and you are incompetent as a problem solver. It's, it's like thousands of examples where you don't get to solve a problem yourself. You simply have to look for the answer and the answer exists out there. So we have this idea, this mindset that, okay, we've got to find the right answer. We've got to find the right answer. It's out there somewhere. So we're on our phones looking for the right answer rather than trying to think about something. We don't know what thinking is. Thinking is simply looking for the answer. The answer exists out there. It's a very modern mindset. Um, the assumptions, or it's a modern positivistic mindset that the answer is out there somewhere. Um, the, tr the truth is out there. Let's go find it. Let's hunt it down. Once we get it, we can stop looking for it. <laughs> well, this may be helpful for doing well in a Jeopardy game or some sort of trivial knowledge competition. It doesn't really prepare you to solve problems in your own life. So, for instance, you have a relationship problem and um, you're not really sure how to meet eye to eye with somebody. The, the assumption is, well, I won't be able to figure out the answer, but I better go find the answer so I can just apply it to this situation because this situation is the same as a thousand other situations that are just like it. So what does thinking actually involve, or what, what does productive thinking involve? It involves you taking a relationship to the problem and living the solution. The solution happens by virtue of you facing the problem and working through whatever ways you can work through the problem. So that means I'll arrive at a different kind of solution than you may arrive, or we may arrive at the same solution different ways. And that's okay, because problem solving does not occur independently of us. We are, in our own right, capable of problem solving. But we don't get a lot of practice with this. So when we finally face a real problem in life after high school or college or whatever, um, it'd be important if we understand that we can solve problems, even if we have no idea what the answer looks like, even if no one's ever solved the problem before. 
we can still solve the problem, and we can live our own solution, then we take ownership of it, we find meaning in it, we make the meaning in it, um, and it matters to us. Um, the solution is that which works for us. And so think about that in terms of the kind of meaningful learning that Carl Rogers describes.